So hi, everybody. I'm uh, Andrew Lowe, and I want to welcome all of you to MIT on behalf of the MIT Sloan School of Management, the Laboratory for Financial Engineering, and the Koch Institute. We're really happy to have all of you today and extraordinarily grateful for taking time out of your day to be with us for focusing on a case study on appendiceal cancer. So let me begin with uh, some thank yous and then talk a bit about motivation, how this conference got together, and what I think we're going to try to achieve today. So first of all, I want to thank our steering committee for organizing this meeting. This would not have happened, and the array of talent that we have in this room would not have been possible without all of the individuals listed here. And we also want to thank, in addition to the steering committee, a number of others who introduced us to the broader network of folks working on appendiceal cancer and um, really have put together uh, a, an extraordinary collection of uh, experts. Oh, but we also want to thank patients that uh, have given us the reason for being here. And you're going to hear from three of them uh, today. Uh, one is a family member who lost somebody to appendiceal cancer and uh, two are patients that are dealing with it right now. And they have agreed to, uh, to speak to us uh, you know, via video conference. Uh, and, uh, and last but certainly not least, I want to thank our administrative staff, um, Jana Cummings, Kate Lyons, Taka Barron, who are, you've seen are outside, and uh, Lauren Graham from Pinnacle Care, who has been uh, uh, extraordinarily helpful uh, in, um, in helping us to manage this, uh, this meeting. So, uh, and finally, thanks to all of you for, for being here. And uh, we're really looking forward to getting your, your expertise and making progress um, uh, in this area. So I want to start with uh, motivation for why we're here and why we hold these meetings at the MIT Laboratory for Financial Engineering. Uh, it's obvious why the Koch Institute is here, but why are we at the LFE and the Sloan School here? And it has to do with this, the valley of death. This is something that I was introduced to years ago when I got interested in healthcare. Before that time, much of my focus has been on applying mathematical and statistical models to investing and risk management, hedge fund strategies. I had no interest or expertise in healthcare whatsoever. And I was introduced to this through personal reasons, friends and family dealing with various kinds of cancer. And as I started talking to some of you who are in the room today, over 10 years ago, asking you, what do we do about this? I kept coming across this notion of the valley of death the area between uh, basic science and, and medical research and phase one clinical trials. And it was really hard to get money for focusing on translational medicine. And I, I couldn't understand why that was the case, because there was a lot of expertise, not just in this room, but more broadly in biomedicine. We were at an inflection point in dealing with disease. And yet, um, somehow, we couldn't get money to fund the things that would get uh, ideas from the laboratory into the clinic. And after a while, I realized the answer, at least from my economic perspective, since I'm an economist, is the fact that there is increasing risk and uncertainty. And that's one of the reasons why it's hard to raise money at this very early stage. And the fact that all of you are making breakthroughs every day on our behalf, those breakthroughs are actually creating risk and uncertainty, oddly enough. As you all help us get smarter about dealing with disease, that disruptive technology often disrupts investments that were made years ago and causes losses that were unanticipated. And so the question about risk and uncertainty really came uh, front and center for me as a financial economist. That's something that I believe we know something about. And so for those of you who've been here, you know what I'm about to do now. I'm going to give you an example to try to explain how risk impacts investments. And I do this with all of my first year MBA students, so I apologize if you've already seen this before. I start with an example of four different financial investments. I don't tell them what, my, uh, what those investments are or over what time period they span. I merely show them what happens when you invest a dollar in each one of these. A dollar turns the green asset into $2 over this multi-year investment horizon. Not very rewarding, but not particularly risky. The red line turns a dollar into five dollars, way more rewarding, but quite a bit more volatile, more risk. The uh, blue line is the most rewarding of all, turning a dollar into eight dollars, but uh, way more risky, 
and the black line somewhere in the middle. And so I asked my MBA students, if you could have only one of these investments for your life savings, for your children's college education fund, for your parents' or grandparents' 401k, what would you invest if you could pick only one of these four? You couldn't mix and match. How many of you would pick the green line? Show of hands. Anybody? Yeah, all right. Obviously, nobody from compliance in this audience, OK? Um, how, about the, uh, how about the red line? How many people pick the red line? Oh, wow. Not that many, OK? For those of you who haven't picked it, um, you're going to need to call your broker after I tell you what it is. Um, the blue line, anybody the blue line? OK, these are the startup uh, folks and uh, starting up your biotech companies. And then the, uh, the black line. Yeah, by far the most popular asset in all of the audiences that I presented this to, mainly because it seems to have the best trade-off between risk and reward. That's really what it's all about, risk and reward. Well, so let me tell you what you all pick. First of all, the time period is from uh, 1990 to 2008. And the green line, the line that none of you picked, that's the U US Treasury bills, the safest asset in the world at least for the next few weeks. So we'll see how the budget discussions go. <laughs> but assuming that we agree to pay our bills, very safe, but not very rewarding. In fact, net negative return if you factor in inflation since 2008. The red line that very few of you picked, most of you already own that asset. That's the S&P 500. So if you didn't pick it, you may want to call your broker and do some trades. But if you did pick it in 2008, congratulations, you would have done spectacularly well over the last uh, 12, 13 years. And uh, the blue line, that's the single pharmaceutical company, Pfizer, one of the most successful companies in the world. And if you had picked Pfizer, well, congratulations, you would have done even better since 2008, not the least because of Pfizer-BioNTech. The black line, the most popular asset among all of these different audiences, that's the private fund called the Fairfield Century Fund, which was the feeder fund for the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme, which is <laughs> why I had to stop it in 2008. Like a moth to a flame, we are all drawn to high yielding, low risk assets. And in finance, we have a term that describes it. It's called the Sharpe Ratio. Sharpe Ratio is the Average return of an investment above and beyond T-bills divided by the risk as measured by the return standard deviation, the, the fluctuations. And so you can see that the sharp ratios of those three assets above T-bills is 0.34 for Pfizer, about the same 0.33 for the S&P. And at least on paper, before it blew up, the Madoff Ponzi scheme had a sharp ratio that was an order of magnitude higher. That's how the scam ended up suckering in so many investors. The reason I'm showing this to you is because biomedicine has had a sharp ratio that's been declining over the last few years. Not because the returns aren't there. They certainly are in aggregate. The problem is that any one investment is extraordinarily risky, and the risk has actually gone up thanks to the breakthroughs that you are all pioneering on our behalf. And so that's the challenge from my outsider's perspective of why we have a valley of death and what we collectively and today certainly can do to change things. What do we need to do to increase the Sharpe ratio? Very simple. All we have to do is increase the numerator or decrease the denominator. That's all. Now, how do we do that? And that's the hard part that you're going to all help with today. Basically, as we make progress in the science, in organizational structure, in technology, funding, and government policy, all of those things serve to increase the numerator and decrease the denominator. The scientific breakthroughs that you're all making, that can increase the numerator for specific biotech companies or nonprofit efforts that come out of this. But I think that financial structuring can help by helping to reduce the denominator, by reducing the risk, by using different business models and financing structures to be able to achieve that goal. And so hopefully by collaborating, by talking with one another, we can accomplish that. Now, we've held many conferences like this. In fact, the last time we've done this it was uh, the, the, the very first time we did this 
was just about 10 years ago. So this is the 10th anniversary of our getting started. And the, the first conference was called Cancer X, and it was in June of 2013. And I'm really delighted and honored that a number of the people that helped us to organize that meeting are here, actually here today. Uh, people that I reached out to out of desperation because that was a period where over five or six years, seven people close to me all died of cancer. And it was through that struggle that I tried to find out what we could do collectively to help. And I contacted a number of people that are sitting in this audience about specific patients that I was trying to help. And um, I'm really grateful for all of you for that, uh, the help that you gave. And one of the things that came out of those discussions was, you know, we should organize a conference to bring together all of the relevant stakeholders. It was actually quite a selfish um, act on my part because I, I talked to one expert, biomedical expert, about why we weren't making progress. And I would be told, well, it's because, you know, we just don't have the funds. And then I would talk to a venture capitalist who invests in these companies, and I said, well, I'm, t I'm being told that there's not enough money. And the venture capitalist says, well, you know, we, we get our money from limited partners, and, you know, it's just too risky, you know, because who knows what the FDA is going to decide, and, uh, you know, it, it, we can't get enough investment capital. So then I talked to people at the FDA, and I said, why aren't you approving more drugs? You're taking so much time, and you're being so conservative. And they say, well, you know, we don't have, we don't have good drugs to approve. You know, we should make more progress on the scientific part. And I'd go to NCI, and one after the other, I'd get different stories about what was wrong. And so I finally said, you know, it's really hard for me to do this. Can I get everybody in a room together? And then let's discuss it, you know, interactively so that you can't really say it's something else so we can get to the bottom of this. And, you know, this... Uh, you know, the, the, the process reminded me a bit about the organizational studies uh, um, uh, arguments that were made in my, at the Sloan School about matrix management. You know, matrix management is this idea where you have different reporting lines. And when I saw the matrix, my first reaction was, well, you know, gee, this, is, this means you can pass the buck in two dimensions. It's very frustrating. And so in this audience, we can't pass the buck because all the stakeholders are represented. And the hope is that not people aren't trying to pass the buck. I think they're just, they're not familiar with all of the various different pieces. By the end of the day, I think all of you will be exposed to all the pieces, and I think we'll be able to make great progress. And I hope we do on, for the sake of patience, because that's really the focus. This meeting that happened on July, June 16th, it happened seven days after the death of one of the patients that that you helped with. Svetlana Sussman was the uh, executive director of the Laboratory for Financial Engineering. She worked with me for years before um, uh, in, in a position that Jana Cummings now holds. And she developed a colorectal cancer. And I contacted a number of you and asked for help. And um, so one of the reasons for organizing the conference was for her. Um, unfortunately, she, she died, as I said, seven days before the conference. Uh, one of the most difficult things in my life was serving as MC for that meeting, um, you know, in the aftermath. But it actually motivated me, and it motivated all of the people that were at the conference to know that, you know, people are waiting for what we're doing today. And you're going to hear from patients that are waiting for what we're about to do today. And so yesterday's uh, uh, comments by Greg Simon and Chris Austin were right on point. We got to get things done. Um, and uh, that's, what, uh, that's what the hope is. So since then, we've had many conferences, again, with many of you who helped to organize it. And because of the energy that you brought to these meetings, we have actually made a lot of progress. Uh, for example, um, we've had a number of papers published on analytics. We've uh, helped a number of companies get started. You'll hear from some of those companies. By the way, um, in terms of conflicts, I know that you uh, in the medical profession are particularly sensitive to that. Um, I have a number of conflicts. All of my affiliations are listed on my website uh, with a number of the companies that I've invested in. Some of them are represented here today. And the hope is that you're going to see from their examples what is possible. 
But out of those meetings have also come other uh, uh, examples of progress. For example, in one of the meetings where we held on ovarian cancer, we now have an adaptive platform trial that was launched at USC um, uh, and uh, GCAR. And it's uh, an amazing thing, a multi-center uh, clinical trial um, focused on ovarian cancer. I believe that we can create a multi-center clinical trial, an adaptive platform trial for appendiceal cancer. And I believe that that will actually be a profitable thing to do. It will be the right thing to do for patients, and it will be a profitable thing that can be financed by the private sector. And there are a number of investors here that are perfectly capable of doing that. Uh, so there, there, there's real, real progress that comes out of these meetings, and the hope is that we're going to see the same today. Thanks to all of you who are, are, are here. So I'm going to turn it over uh, in a minute to Steve Wallman, uh, who is one of the reasons that we're here. Um, Steve and I go back a long ways. I was quite surprised to hear from him recently because you know, my, the, the, the last set of interactions that we had was when Steve was commissioner of the, uh, one of the commissioners of the SEC. And uh, that was a domain that he and I knew well. Uh, uh, he from the regulatory perspective and, and I from the financial economics perspective. And then uh, shortly after that, Steve uh, ended up with his own company called Folio FN, one of the, the, the most uh, important ideas that, that uh, we have in finance is to put investments into portfolios and to manage them as portfolios. And Steve basically created the organization, uh, the business, that would do it, and that business was recently acquired by Goldman Sachs. So it's obviously a very valuable and important idea. But the context in which I was reconnected with Steve was quite surprising, it was through the Koch Institute, where I was told that Steve was supporting some cancer research in appendiceal cancer, and that uh, he had heard about some of the work that I was doing through Koch. And so um, uh, Jane connected us, and it turns out that his wife was dealing with appendiceal cancer. And so I suggested somewhat brashly, Steve, we ought to organize a conference around Kathy. And I, know, I knew that he was immediately uncomfortable with that because you know, organizing a meeting around one person, and um, you know, I, I had no shame because I'm used to doing this. And for me, it's wonderful motivation because there's nothing that concentrates the mind like the gallows, and we're all facing the gallows when it comes to cancer. And so he graciously agreed to allow us to organize the meeting, but not just around Kathy, around the notion of dealing with rare cancers and how we go from rare to common and create a business model that's sustainable. And I can think of no better person to take these ideas and run with it than, than Steve Waldman, because he is an expert in finance. Um, you know, as a financial economist, I can tell you that those who can't do, teach. And those who can't teach, teach Jim. Uh, at least I don't teach Jim, but, but, but Steve actually does. And so I think we have the opportunity. Um, so um, let me uh, just uh, conclude by saying that one of the key aspects of the meeting is to break down barriers. There are big cultural differences between finance and medicine and regulatory affairs and so on. And that diversity is extremely valuable as long as we learn how to talk to each other. And so that is also going to be part of the goal. Um, so, uh, uh, and then ultimately the focus is on patients and that's what we're going to hear from uh, shortly. So with some logistics before I turn it over to Steve and then, uh, and then to Jane. Um, the past meetings that we've held, as those of you who've been here know, have always operated under Chatham House rules, meaning that we don't quote each other, we don't uh, videotape, we have no press. And we do this specifically because we want to encourage free and open dialogue, particularly early stages of these meetings where there was just a lot of issues that needed to be addressed very frankly about what was wrong with the system. However, the steering committee has decided that we're going to depart from that policy today. We're going to videotape this. So we are not operating under Chatham House rules. We are going to be quoting people. And as part of your coming here, there was a particular uh, uh, notification that if you came, you would understand that we would be operating under these new rules for today. So if you're uncomfortable with it, uh, please see Jaina and please uh, uh, you know, keep that in mind. We will have to address that. The reason that we changed this policy is because we wanted to make progress as quickly as possible in this very fast-moving field 
And there are people that couldn't be here today. We want them to be able to see what came out of this meeting uh, and be able to watch the videos. So that key, key point. Uh, also, want to let you know that there'll be a small number of individuals that will be online attending remotely. Uh, these are appendiceal cancer patients as well as some of their family members. Uh, so just be aware of that. Um, and then finally, Wi-Fi password is up, uh, upper right-hand corner. Um, so if uh, there's no password, you can uh, log into that. Um, and in terms of the sessions that you're going to hear, we're going to start with the science first. As you all know from previous meetings, those of you who are here, the morning is devoted to science. And the afternoon is going to be focusing on other stakeholders and business models because science should come before business. It's too often, it, it happens the other way around. And that never leads to good outcomes. So the morning will be science. We're going to have panelists who will be providing brief opening remarks. But the majority of each of the sessions will be devoted to Q&A because obviously there are as many experts in the audience as there will be up here. We really want the panelists just to facilitate discussion. Um, the moderators reserve the right to interrupt. If it turns out that an individual is monopolizing the conversation or pontificating a little bit too much, uh, hopefully that won't be an issue, but that is something that the moderators will reserve the right to do. Um, and, um, and so finally, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for taking time away from your patients, from your labs, from your portfolios. And, um, and thank you for doing what you do for patients on behalf of all families and their friends. All right, thanks, Steve. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew. Um, that took a lot of my, uh, my thunder, so uh, I'll try to make this a little bit shorter then and, and briefer. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's something that is really important, as you'll see in a few moments. Um, the folks here who have put on this conference are folks that have uh, provided a lot of time and a lot of energy into thinking about how to make this all work. Uh, and their passion and their diligence is something I, I really appreciate. Uh, so thank you very much. A number of the people in the audience are folks that my wife has been dealing with um, and uh, folks that I've been dealing with in terms of the, the doctoring sense. Um, and I wanted to thank them personally as well. So thank you for, for that. Um, for everybody, um, you know, your time, your interest, your expertise, obviously it's critically important. It's amazingly important. Um, I'm. Impressed. Um, Andrew does this all the time. Um, I haven't. Uh, and uh, having this assembled group is something that was an aspiration, but I didn't necessarily think it would actually come together. Uh, so um, I can't tell you how much I'm very grateful for uh, all of your willingness to spend your time and, uh, and participate in this. Um, for some of you attending, I know these are lifelong passions and the science is what drives you. Uh, for others, um, it's the important regulatory, policy, political, uh, legal, institutional issues that uh, have attracted your attention. Uh, for others, it's the question of how to make a good investment, get a good return, and uh, reducing risk. Um, all those are, are great pursuits. Um, out of those, uh, we would expect to have great things come. Um, and uh, again, we uh, have assembled this group in order to try to combine all those different stakeholders to, uh, to have that occur. Uh, for me, as you'll soon see, this is really highly personal. Um, uh, just as my wife and I were set to start a new life, uh, I just sold my company to Goldman, um, we decided to do what I think most people would probably do, which is get an annual physical. Um, and in that context, uh, just happenstance, my wife happened to uh, have an ultrasound. And in that, um, they discovered something that needed further investigation, and it turned out to be stage four high-grade uh, goblet cell appendiceal cancer. Um, before that diagnosis, Kathy was extraordinarily healthy. Uh, she ran 5Ks. She'd signed up for the Army 10-miler. Um, she's smart. She's determined. She was a former partner in a major law firm. She was a senior government official. She was the deputy counsel to the president, not the immediately preceding one, but one way back. Um, and uh, she's just a remarkable person. That's not all. She actually also became a master gardener so she could grow her, grow her own vegetables. Um, she became a pescatarian a long time ago. 
Uh, she had no known risk factors. Never smoked, never did anything like that. So the stage four diagnosis seemed more like a, a car crash uh, than a disease. Um, it took us really from the side um, and we were blind going into it. I realized how little actual interaction I had had previously with the medical community. We were thankfully pretty healthy up until that point. Um, and I really didn't understand cancer. I didn't understand how regulatory issues came about, how people had drugs to go through approval processes that could take years and hundreds of millions of dollars. I didn't understand um, some of the institutional issues within various research entities and others as to motivations in, at times for cooperation, motivations at times for perhaps lacking uh, cooperation. Um, collaboration seemed to be an interesting concern for me. Uh, and what happened is I started to ask a lot of questions. I started to listen, I got answers, and those answers actually prompted more questions. Um, the more I got into it, the more I met brilliant, really dedicated people who were passionate about what they were doing, but who in many cases were sort of stymied by what was going on within their institutions in terms of being able to work with other institutions uh, or other groups. Um, in many cases, it was my former colleagues, lawyers, um, who seemed to be the problem. And I'll tell you one quick little anecdote. I had a discussion with uh, one lawyer for one larger institution just a few weeks ago on a question with regard to a licensing matter. Um, and there were two ways for the result to go. Uh, and uh, it could have been something that was for the benefit of the institution or something that was for the benefit of the public and curing cancer. And we argued for a little while. And at the end of it, this lawyer who got pretty exasperated with me for pushing this said, look, my job is to protect the institution. And I got pretty exasperated with that and said, I thought your job was to cure, cure cancer. And it's that differential that I think really is important for people in this room to understand. Because you are the ones who can go back to some of these organizations on the legal side, on the policy side, and try to convince them that the mission actually has to be the, the precedent. It has to be what actually drives everything, not the institution itself. If we can get some of that understanding through, then I think we can do some of the things that Andrew actually described in terms of the sharp ratio. If we can have more collaboration, you can actually more diversification. More diversification, my own company was built on the notion, you can actually increase your return for lower risk or increase your uh, or decrease your risk for whatever level of return you would otherwise be willing to settle for. Both of those are fine. That's what you want to do. You want to get higher returns, lower risk. We can do that. And I don't mean just in the economic sense. I mean also in the scientific sense. We can get greater returns for science out of the science if we can figure out a way to diversify, if we can figure out a way to make things work together and collaboratively. So I asked a lot of questions, um, and I got a lot of answers, and I asked a lot more questions. Um, and at some point or the other, I got the final answer that my father always gave me, uh, which is because that's the way it is. And uh, you know what I always asked after that was why? And my father at that point, usually we just walk out of the room um, in exasperation, but at this point, we've got everybody in the room uh, so we're going to try to answer some of these questions. I'm the least informed and least educated, I think, of everybody in this room on these topics and these issues. Um, so I, I come only with questions. I don't come at this point with answers. I think uh, there are some places where I think I've got some hints of what answers might be. Um, but you are the experts. And you're the ones who are going to have to be able to actually make those answers work, or at least figure out the path to get to answers that could work. Um, at this point, um, you know, I, I, when I asked Andrew about this, and Andrew suggested very kindly, why don't we do something that would be this kind of a conference, and thank you very much for suggesting that, um, I figured that it was probably not possible to get this kind of an assembled group. Uh, I know a number of the folks here, and I know the quality of their work and their expertise. I know their experience. I know how much time they put in for their patients and others. Um, and the fact that they can spare a day or so to be here 
um, is really pretty phenomenal. So I thank you for that. I didn't know if it was be, would be possible to organize this workshop. Um, um, and I didn't know if we would have the time, given all the other things going on with ASCO meetings and holidays, et cetera, to actually get it done in time. But I felt that there was an urgency to it. And the urgency, of course, comes in my case because of how personal this all is. Um, at this point, what I'd like to do is actually show you how personal it is. Um, this is uh, something that my motivation to try to find something faster than in the academic pursuit of dozens of years, or uh, actually perhaps I read a piece, which I thought was very frustrating actually, from some um, experts in cancer who were saying that they thought the moonshot um, that was announced by President Biden uh, is too aspirational. Uh, that the notion of being able to get to having cancer deaths um, by the sort of middle or part of the century is too much. That cancer is too difficult. Um, too many different kinds of things are cancer. Research takes a long time. It goes slowly. Uh, and we shouldn't rush it. With all due respect, when you have a wife who's in a hospital room, that doesn't sound like a good answer. So let me, if I can, ask uh, for a brief video. Um, Kathy was willing to do this and able to do this before her surgery. She's now at NCI um, in a hospital room uh, under Dr. Blakely's excellent, remarkable care. And Dr. Yaffe and others uh, have really been considerably helpful in all of that. So thank you very much for all that. Um, she had an 11 hour surgery uh, a week ago today. Uh, I'm pained that uh, I'm not there, uh, but I'm glad that I could do this for her in the meantime. Uh, so thank you, and if you could do the video, that would be great. Hello, oh, I'm Kathy Woolman. You've met my indefatigable husband, Steve Woolman, without whose love and support and persistence, I wouldn't be here today. I'm so grateful. I say thank you to him so often, he's asked me to stop. I'm impressed by the unbridled generosity of the group that has come together today. Uh, some people I've met, and have been a beneficiary of their care, Dr. Garrett Nash, Dr. Andrew Blakely. By the time you see this, I will have had a second cytoreduction reduction surgery with Dr. Blakely at National Institutes of Health. There are so many people to thank for bringing this together, not only Steve Wallman, whose persistence you now understand, but uh, Dr. Wadlow, Dr. Sursik, Dr. Connell, Dr. Shen, Jennifer Carter, Jane Wilkinson, <laughs> Andrew Lowe, a longtime friend, thank you. And Lauren Graham, our persistent, wonderful person from Pinnacle Healthcare who has shepherded this and shepherded my care throughout all of this. By now, I've had uh, four surgeries um, and about 30 rounds of chemotherapy. And um, this is such a sneaky disease, and it's hard to track. It's hard to measure progress. But I've been very fortunate. My CT scans have been informative and helpful. A diagnostic laparoscopy performed by Dr. Blakely recently uh, confirmed that the disease is in retreat. I feel very fortunate. But this is such a sneaky disease. I've already had one recurrence. Uh, and it was as surprising as the original diagnosis. The original diagnosis resulted from a routine um, ultrasound that showed the presence of about 200 milliliters of ascites, less than a quarter cup. And because of that incidental finding, the investigation began and I was discovered to have appendiceal cancer. It's sneaky. And so if I were going to do a public service announcement about appendiceal cancer, it would have to be something like this. Do you feel great? VO2 max on the rise? Best two-mile trail time ever? You might have appendix cancer, also known as appendiceal cancer. Now, when I tell people that I had appendiceal cancer, um, they're very surprised. They're as surprised as I was. Um, people don't realize that you can have cancer in your appendix, and their first reaction is, well, just have it removed. It's a vestigial organ. Well, the stitchal organ in my foot, this thing's trying to kill me. I explained that I did have it taken out and that it left a mess. And it's been the task of the last several years to try to clean up that mess. So uh, 
I wonder sometimes, the appendix is supposed to be a vestigial organ. It's not vestigial at all. all. Apparently it decided it had a job to go into overdrive and produce uh, cancerous cells. What's next? Is my uvula going to turn on me? You're just not safe from this sneaky disease. So when I think about my experience, I'm, I'm so grateful for the collaboration that you've agreed to put together in participating in this conference so that people who are knowledgeable in the field can figure out where they started, where they've been, what worked, what didn't work. It's important to discuss what didn't work so that we don't leave false trails for other researchers. And I'm so grateful for your willing to, willingness to attend, your willingness to participate, and your willingness to begin an effort that will extend beyond the four walls of this conference and the, the time allotted to it to try to do uh, the kind of breakthrough research that all of you are already involved in. There are so many reasons to be hopeful in this age of breakthroughs. Dr. Sursik's work in rectal cancer, uh, breakthroughs in pediatric bone cancer, and the path-breaking research that all of you are already involved in. So I'm, I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you for participating. And, um, you know, people have asked me, you know, how do you, how do you get up in the morning? Well, um, I'm married to Steve, and Steve is a force unto himself, as you already know. But it's important to find reasons to stay positive. I don't always succeed. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. But there are things you can do when you're in treatment and things you can't do. I think back to the first time I met Dr. Nash in his office in New York, and I surmised talking to him that he was from Ireland. And so when he left the room, I thanked him in the Irish language, God of my gut. So Dr. Nash turned to his fellow, who was in the room with us, and said, I know it sounds like she just growled at you, but that's actually how we say thank you in Irish. So inspired by Dr. Nash and with time on my hands and restricted to some things that I could do rather than things I couldn't do, I applied for Irish citizenship, which I'm uh, eligible for because my grandparent was born there. So um, this is the result. I am now a dual Irish citizen. Thank you, Dr. Nash, for that inspiration. And thank you for your help. Thank you to all of you who have helped me along the way. Thank you. So thank you. Um, I look forward to working with all of you over the, the course of the day, assuming I can make it through the whole course of the day. Um, and uh, as you know, this is just the beginning of, uh, of a series of events um, on this. Uh, we will send out a survey afterwards that talks about potential mini workshops, uh, small working groups, um, folks that might wish to get together to pursue various elements of regulatory policy or financing or others. Um, uh, and um, I'd like to do what we can to keep the effort going. So thank you, um, and uh, I think we're now up to Jane.